Welcome to Connections Lab, a twice monthly webinar on progressive framing and messaging. Tonight we speak with Greg Layden, a biological anthropologist who has studied the evolution of human language and culture and a political activist who develops policy and writes about progressive issues. He plays several roles in the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party and is a leader in various indivisible groups. He said the successful and eponymous blog Greg Layden's blog on evolution, education, environment, and politics. He is also the author of the novel In Search of Sungu Dogo, which I have read and enjoyed tremendously. Now we hit the record button a minute late, so here's the fill in and then we'll get to Greg. The first question is, why is the study of anthropology important to how we approach messaging? And Greg replies that anthropology tends in modern form to glean insight from observation rather than from modeling and is comfortable with enigmas or things that don't make sense. Observe human communication. It is not predictable or even buildable from first principles and it generally makes no sense. And also anthropology addresses and is part of linguistics. And now we'll join Greg. Because human beings and human culture is, is not that structured and not that predictable, we tend to work on the on, from the ground up. <clears throat> and that's actually turned out to be pretty important. And one of the main points we'll be talking about later is how communication works. We tend to overstate how regularized the process of communication is. And it really isn't that regularized. It's not that, it's not that easy to structure it as a, in a sort of a framework system. And the other reason is because central to a lot of anthropology, in particular, a lot of stuff I've done is language. Linguistic processes, meaning that which has to do with language and linguistic process is bigger than just speaking. <clears throat> it's the way that we think. If a human being is doing something with their mind, they're doing something linguistically, even if they're not saying something out loud. The linguistic process is how we perceive the world, how we internalize it, how we think about it internally. And that's in the, that's in the purview of, well, psychology, different fields of anthropology, uh, linguistics itself is a subfield, is a discipline. Uh, so that's, that's one reason why I, communication is, in a sense, uh, a process of, it's a linguistic process. So we study that, we study language. And, um, and you mentioned this is, this is unique to humans. And, uh, and uh, uh, back in, uh, when I was in uh, graduate school in the, in the late Cretaceous period, uh, I actually worked on the original project teaching sign language to chimpanzees. And, um, and one of our one of the other research assistants, uh, we were trying to figure out whether or not the chimps had language. And we hauled in linguists, and they were useless because we couldn't get a one of them to give us a clear definition of la of language. So we kind of got rid of that. And one of my friends came up with the best one, saying they needed it to get by during the day, and they did. In order to, we weren't allowed to speak on the project, but we'd use sign language, and that's what the chimps used. So they never heard any English. And so they needed if they wanted to, you know, get in a get in a truck and go get an ice cream cone. They had to sign ice cream, uh, but but uh, but I think what you're getting at, and I know you know a lot about the neurological processes. One thing we knew from the studies was that the 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 chimps around a, between ages three and five, they pretty much track with humans as far as how much language they acquire and how they use it. In fact, in uh, they pick it up a little bit earlier and and are a little more fluent in it in the first couple of years than humans are. But after that, the humans just take off. And right. um, uh, yeah, and how how would you address that? I mean, somebody... yeah. Well, for one thing, uh, okay, language, as you noted, is a is a strictly human thing. There isn't any other animal that has language, what we call language for humans, and that is not a species centric approach is simply that what language consists of is not found in other animals, but parts of it are in chimps and maybe in some other apes. There's bits and pieces of it over there in that, those other species. Uh, and it turns out that when you look at it empirically, chimpanzees that learn language, especially the ones that start young, that, that start as, as little toddler baby chimps, uh, they get it, like I said, about as far as a five-year-old. And then a human continues on and that is the age around three or four up to five or six in humans that if you track our developmental patterns and compare them to the development of apes, whether it's physical or psychological development, 
that's a phase that exists in human development that does not exist in apes. So we have this additional years of learning and we are learning our culture. We are learning our linguistic abilities. We're learning to be speakers of language. <clears throat> humans that don't, humans that don't encounter language as they grow up is very rare. The wild child phenomenon. There are examples. Humans that are kept away from language completely develop their linguistic abilities about to the level that those chimps do. And that's where they go. And a lot of training and therapy can bring them a little bit farther, but not much farther. So what, what, what we are, we are tracking with the chimps we're doing, whatever the chimps are doing exactly like you say, pretty much, but then continuing onwards, but notice those chimps weren't talking. And this is another key point and that is a really important point. It turns out really critically important to understand that language is not fixed to a modality. Uh, for example, speech, that works. We use it all the time. Speaking and hearing is the most common way language works. But you know what? You can write it down and read it. And that's interesting because this is an evolved thing in our, in our species. R being able to write and read language would be the equivalent of having a horse be able to fly with wings if you happen to have wings. Okay. It, it, language can be done with sign language. It can be done inside your head. Okay. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't fixed to a particular modality of operation. Everything else we do is. We have a physical organ that maps onto a behavior. And if you remove the physical organ, the behavior really can't be done. You really can't walk without legs. Now you can locomote and move without legs, but you can't do walking without legs because that's what walking is. It's moving your legs a certain way. Whereas language is independent of, of it's agnostic as to modality. And that's a really important point. Well, explore more of that later, I think, but that, that, um, that makes language have to do certain work that it may not otherwise have to do it was just a, an appendage that had a behavior attached to it. You know, you're talking so much about, about, you know, the, the use of limbs or the use of, of various parts of our body, including our brain. Um, uh, we're interesting, uh, George Lakoff in metaphors we live by, he talks about the metaphors we use are often based in a relationship to the body and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, toward or away up and down for, you know, we use up for North and down for South and things of that sort. So that we, we do that all the time. So that kind of relates here. And um, mm -hmm. uh, um, also the, um, the neurobiology of language has to take into account that language happens with voice, with things in print and uh, sign languages and other such. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, wondering, you know, where, where, where we go with that. You said there's some problems with that. And uh, yeah. Okay. I, I guess I, there's an analogy I've been thinking about lately that might help this. Uh, and you think about, we all, I don't know if any of you all saw don't look up the movie, but if you didn't, that's okay. Cause somewhere along the line, you saw a movie where there was a scientist who knew what to do and the government ignoring them. Okay. So let's refine that slightly. Uh, you imagine there's a group of engineers that know how to build a better satellite. They figured it out. And there's a company that puts up satellites and they would like to have a better satellite. Okay. The way it normally works is the company puts out a request for proposals in the trade yeah. journals or wherever in, uh, and, the various, and the various companies that might make a better satellite um, propose, we can do it for you. We can do it for you. We can do it for you. And one of them is chosen. They come into the boardroom, they explain the idea in detail, they provide reports, and eventually they proceed on this project to make a better satellite. That's what actually happens in real life. Imagine instead, the, 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 the engineering firm that can make the better satellite has to show up at a building and they know the company they want to hire them. They don't know the name of the company for sure, but they know it's in the building somewhere on the seventh or eighth floor, they're not sure. And they walk in the building and there's a security guard there who's actually not even a real security guard. It's like. The real security guard was drunk last night. He got his brother-in-law to come in and take the job. He's watching the game. And they have to get the security guard to let them upstairs and then convince them to be hired. This is a, a, a zany, antic-filled cinema, okay? They, what do they do? How do they do that? Well, somebody goes over the other side of the lobby and creates a distraction, catches something on fire. Somebody else goes over and does a separate, the coding. The coding person goes over and figures out how to get past the key on the elevator. Yeah, go in then, your room. Then, then, they, then they, then they all go. Hear. Then they all go into the elevator and sneak up to the top floor, and they burst into the boardroom, 
And the people are there looking at them like, who the hell are you? And it turns out that they have a, 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 a thing they can do. It reminds me of, it was Arthur Clark, I think, has a guy walk into the Pepsi, owner of Pepsi's corporation, bursts into his office with, the, with a, a, a button that says Coca-Cola on it. And the guy says, why are you wearing that? That's my, my enemy company. He says, well, if this was the moon, this is what you'd be seeing, the technology we have to put a sign on the moon. It's either them or you. Okay? So they burst into the boardroom with the one sentence that's going to attract their attention. It'll actually be the young female uh, uh, niece of the board leader who will actually have it. But anyway, somebody will say, oh, yes, we have to listen to these people. And that's how they get the job. Okay? That's what it's like to talk to another person. Okay? Because our system of understanding things uses hearing that was evolved to operate in lizards and frogs. It uses sight that was evolved to operate in mammals. It uses um, memory storage systems that use the limbic system, which are common in all mammals. We have to, we have to get past the mechanisms that are working the same way in us as they are in aardvarks, okay? We have to get our, if we have to get our information through a bottleneck of physiology that is virtually impossible to pass through, okay? That's the guy at the front desk in the big building. We have to get past it somehow. So for that reason, when you actually look at what works, you look at what, what, langu what linguistic methods work and what processes work to get information across, it doesn't always make sense, okay? A, a really good way of thinking about it is a really well done story that concludes information People will read that story or hear that story and they'll know those things versus the same exact information on a Wikipedia page. The Wikipedia page is better because it has everything precisely laid out with references and nothing's left out and a, a committee of thoughtful people have figured it out. But you read that thing and you walk away and you know nothing. Whereas a story, you know, think about the Ken Burns documentary in the Civil War versus the Wikipedia page in the Civil War. Which one are you going to walk away from being enriched and knowing more stuff? Okay, so the, the that's so this, this ends up relating to a lot of different things. But how it is that you get past that bottleneck in physiology? How you get? We have parts of our brain that we have changed for language in our frontal cortex mainly, and it's inside our heads and it handles language, but it's not connected to the outside world directly. It's connected through the same mechanisms that a chimpanzee uses that a macaque uses, that a prosimian primate uses, that your dog uses, roughly. There's obviously some differences, but that, that's, that's really the neurobiological problem of language. Yeah, it, it's, it, it is kind of amazing that, uh, that uh, by evolutionary standards, language and uh, even uh, it, language is something that is, is very new and, and rather unique. And uh, also uh, the ability to reason and think it higher levels is very new in the span of time. It's just a blink, maybe a couple thousand years ago, uh, the beginnings of it. And so you know, here we are saddled with this, this brain and this body and these, the way the brain works, which kept us alive for millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years anyway. Um, uh, and our ancestors, uh, certainly, uh, you know, chimpanzees and the rest all the way back to the first cells, all of that evolution simply existed to make sure that we stayed alive long enough to reproduce. And uh, so what ends, what's ended up happening is all these other things have come on to help various uh, animals and, uh, and species uh, to, to, to uh, thrive. And humans have, have just developed this thing. And, you know, the rational brain, you know, what you're talking about, I, you know, you can see how hard it is to basically, it's like trying to get a Volkswagen to pull a trailer you know, like a Volkswagen bug to pull a trailer. You have this brain that's not really designed for that purpose, but we're kind of doing it anyway. And sometimes it works. <laughs> Maybe when we're going downhill, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and you also mentioned, you also mentioned higher rational thinking. Um, if you, if you look at the, at the philosophy of logic, like what underlies rational thought, what, what system do we use to, to draw correct conclusions from data? And, you know, there's a huge amount on that. You know, Francis Bacon kind of, and a few other people kind of discovered this. There's a, a hypothetical deductive 
method of, of understanding the world around us. And it was invented in the late 16th, early 17th century. What were we doing before that? Well, we're doing it before that the same thing we're doing now, which is ignoring the hypothetical deductive approach. We only use that in the analytical setting of the laboratory or writing the peer reviewed paper, or some of its equivalent of it is done in courtrooms and legal arguments, a version of it. What we're actually doing is we're walking around being human beings, which is not what that is. That's a, a recently developed cultural phenomenon, which is perfectly legitimate. And I won't say anything that logic is wrong. It's not true. It's, it's perfectly real and good. But that's not actually how our brains operate. And just because we were born after Francis Bacon doesn't make our brains different. You know, so it, our, our brains operate in a, in a way. I mean, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, you mentioned something earlier, too, about space. And that relates to, you know, there's this whole Chomsky and idea. This Chomsky and idea is that language you that lang all languages are the same at some under underlying level, all languages are the same. And they kind of emerge de novo and full and complete in human history, which is not true, probably. Um, but uh, I think the Chomsky and sense of language is really because of what you were talking about. We have nouns because there are things. We have verbs because things do things. We have adjectives and adverbs because things and actions have attributes. And we have uh, prepositions because there is a spatial relationship between things. And one of the things that we, when you use a metaphor, and Lakoff's book, Metaphors You Live By, is an absolute must read. Um, everything is a metaphor in a sense, but metaphors are basically manipulating the world of thought through, prep uh, through uh, prepositions in a sense. It's like it, we are, in a sense, relating ourselves in space to other things that are more or less near us in some sense. And by near, I mean, near because it feels similar, near because it's a similar political view, near because it's next to you physically, near because it's something you hold dear, near being so many different things, or far. It's far from us, it's far down the road from anything we'd ever think or whatever. Time and space, and when you see good rhetoric, a lot of this comes down to the following, this first problem of language comes down to the problem that is underappreciated by communicators, I think, is that, the way that you get past the way that you get past that guy in the front desk is it, linguistically the way you get into someone's mind so they pay attention to you they start listening to you and they remember what you said is through rhetorical devices and rhetorical devices very often rely on analogy and metaphor and they often rely on spatial relationships between things or they re rely on metaphors of things that are just normal things in real life and we might come back to this a couple of times in this discussion, but uh, if you read, because this was Martin Luther King's birthday uh, season, read his I Have a Dream speech. And notice, you know, just get out, print it out, get a yellow highlighter. Highlight everything that refers to space or landscape. Thank you. Anything that refers to space or landscape or anything that refers to, um, uh, there's all kinds of allegory and metaphor in his speech. And, and it's, um, it, it's just very common. We have, those are things that relate to the normal human evolutionary past. They relate to just the space we're in. And also, thing that we had this conversation before, uh, our, the part of our brain that helps us put the words in an order that has meaning, that facilitates meaning, there's not a given order that works, every language is different. You can reorder things a lot, but it still has, the order does matter to meaning. The part of our brain that's firing when we are ordering our words and concepts is the same part of the brain that's firing when we're walking. Okay. And that part of the brain that's, that was helping us walk, that's been there for a long time. <laughs> and its use in language is a very recent acceptation or you know, reuse of that part of the brain. So there's that idea. I remember uh, back in, uh, in, uh, in, when I was in, in experimental psychology, um, that there was this notion that learning does not take place outside of muscle movement or without muscle movement, which I thought was the wackiest idea I'd ever heard. And they tested this by, uh, by uh, curarizing, uh, you know, basically drugging dogs so they couldn't move and, uh, and then uh, attempted to have them pair stimuli together and they couldn't do it. And it was kind of interesting. It's, it's amazing how much the, the actual body and the movement of it. Uh, a, a really great example is what happens when you can't 
remember how to spell a word. What's the first thing you do? You grab a pen and a piece of paper and you, 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 you write it down because your hand knows how to spell it, even if you can't right. remember how. And it's just, it's amazing. And Lakoff really goes into it quite a bit in that book of how much the, the physical part is absolutely essential to, to how we communicate. I don't know, I've just found that fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say um, the. Uh, uh, well, I was going to move on to the next question. Did, yeah. Do you have something more on that, though? No, that's good. Okay. Um, so we've seen a lot lately. The uh, of uh, there's been a lot more research done in, in on the brain, and there's been some really interesting imaging techniques. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know uh, uh, functional MRI scans are telling us a, a lot about the brain. Um, right. how are, are, are they, is any of this new stuff helping us see how language works inside the brain? And, and uh, is there anything they've discovered that might help us be better communicators or is it still too early for that? It's, it's, early, to, it's early, but there is some interesting stuff going on. There's one study in particular that I would like to mention you know, so MRI basically is what you're watching the brain firing by watching the use of gases inside the brain cells. And, um, and, and then the brain's doing a lot of work. So you take, you take the brain when it's at rest and kind of subtract it from the brain when it's doing something you've assigned it to do, roughly speaking. And then you get an image, okay? And there's one study that was really interesting. I can send you the link to it so you can put it in the, in the post uh, discussion thing, um, where you have a speaker saying something and when they're saying something in their own brain they appear to be both saying it and listening to what they're saying not listening with their ears but their brain is perceiving what they're saying at a very very tight time frame that's not surprising when you had, have a speaker speaking in russian and a person who doesn't know russian is listening their brain is also reacting but it's kind of a certain low level of reaction. Like I'm hearing sounds. My brain is hearing sounds. That's it. There is actually um, syntax in language, in all language. And we actually perceive syntax a little bit, even though we don't get meaning. Meaning syntax is like the really base level framing for meaning and language. And without the syntax, you don't get the meaning. But you can have the syntax without the meaning. And I think the brain shows signs that it gets that. But when you have two people speaking, one speaking and one listening in the same language, the person who's listening is hearing, they're, they're showing signs of, of basically replicating what the person who's speaking is doing in their brain. A few milliseconds later, they have to, they have to time all this carefully, because it's happening at the speed of sound, the transmission, and the speed of, of, of electrical impulses in the brain, which is a little faster than sound. So they calibrate it, but they're, they're, they're following along with what the, the brain and the speaker is doing certain things and the brain and the listener is doing almost the same exact things. They're replicating the speech in their head in the sense at lightning speed, but then they test comprehension. And when comprehension is at its highest, that is when the listener's brain is actually preceding the speaker's brain in its reaction. It's preceding it. Now it doesn't, it, it can't really be preceding it fully. It's gotta be preceding it partially. It doesn't, hasn't heard all the words yet. I'm talking about while I'm speaking and I'm saying the word aardvark, while I'm saying the word aardvark, just before I say it, you're saying aardvark in your head. And, and although maybe it's not aardvark, it's just some word, like you know it's going to be a noun or something. And your brain starts to process it early. And then when the actual word comes in, then you finish processing it. That actually makes sense. I mean, you go to, when you go to the mailbox to check your mail, you bring your key, even if it's empty, right? I mean, the idea that you would, that the brain would be preceding the processing in expectation actually isn't that weird, but it is also kind of weird. <laughs> that yeah. that's when that's when that underscores a really key point. I think I'm putting way more meaning on this than the see, people who did the research would probably put on it. They probably been more conservative, but what I think that means is it, it's sort of proof that um, that our brains are creating the meaning inside themselves. I'm not transmitting meaning. Okay, a, 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 nice, a nice analogy is vaccines. People often confuse it with vaccines. Vaccines are not treatments. They're not antibiotics, okay? Uh, they're an, not antivirals. They're not antitoxins. They're, they're a memos. They're memos that are sent to your immune system to create an antibiotic, to create 
an antiviral or to create an antitoxic response. Okay, so our bodies are not becoming, are not fighting a virus because the vaccine helps fight the virus. Our body was going to fight the virus anyway. The vaccine is a memo saying, you want to really fight this virus, here's how you do it effectively. So the body does it better. We are sending not strict meaning to each other. We're sending code that is being used in the recipient's brain to create the meaning de novo in their brain. And you know what? It isn't always the meaning that was intended. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, it's the, um, uh, you know, uh, and you take the case where, where both people are in the same language. And, uh, and so let's say you're telling a story, I can see this, this anticipatory uh, response happening as a story is, is happening. And so it's, mm -hmm. so you, the, the listener is anticipating, my guess would be that happens more when the form of, of the telling is in the form of a story because there's yes. the story has a very definite structure to it. Whereas a lot of factual information does not necessarily, I know that sounds strange to say, but it doesn't follow. I, it's, it's harder to anticipate what's happening there. But uh, it also seems that this happens, like you mentioned on a really short time oh. scale. Mm -hmm. so yeah. When it's, uh, when it's, uh, it's happening, what's kind of weird. It's uh, there's just a bare, minimum of stimulus that needs to happen it's mm -hmm. it, it and uh, just enough to get the other person's brain moving along a path and then uh the the words you say the the um uh, as they also are processed and come in can set off cascades of neural activity on other uh on on other ideas or other frames uh if for example i i say um African animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that comes up. Well, even though I'm not talking about giraffes and wildebeest and elephants, uh, your, your, your brain may very well be picturing number of different African animals. So what we say does go into another person's brain. What happens in that person's brain yeah. is uh, way more than we think we're, we're, yeah. we're communicating. And uh, and I guess part of the magic in in framing well and understanding how framing works is that if you can control your language enough, this is the holy grail, but if you can control your language enough, you may have more control over what frames and neural uh, and, and brain cells you actually light up. Does that make any sense or am I crazy? Yeah, no, that does. And I think actually that makes a, a point that we haven't really made yet, which I think is the reason why everyone's here, <laughs> which is. <laughs> We're talking about pretty esoteric philosophical stuff. You don't need to know any of this stuff to go do your messaging, right? Well, you do, because it's like knowing, uh, you know, how uh, a, a, an example that came up in my life fairly recently is, you know, how does it, how does a garbage disposal work? And what we, you know, you just put the stuff in there and you press it, it goes, and then the garbage is gone, right? No, there's more to it than that. It's got an electric motor in it that spins. Electric motors get hot. They have to be cooled. And the garbage disposal is designed to assume two things. You're not going to have it on very long, and you're going to have the water going through it. Now, that's something you know about garbage disposals that maybe you didn't know before. And now that you have this knowledge, you won't be replacing your garbage disposals as often as you used to, because you probably have, if you, you know, some people, some, I know somebody who has to replace a garbage disposal every, like she was complaining about it. I was at her house recently, and she turned her garbage disposal on and left it on for like a minute. It's like, that's going to last. Anyway, the point is, we're looking under the hood of communication. We're looking under the hood of language. Right. And if you know what's going on under the hood. So did you know before that we don't have an evolved mechanism to uh, actually process speech into meaning that's any different than what any other mammal has? We don't have physical parts that does this. We don't even have brain connection to do this at the surface of, of interaction. So you have, to, you have to trick the person in a sense. Not, I don't, the word trick has too much meaning. You have to get your message through putting it in a narrative context is good because of various reasons. Having there be uh, rhetorical forms work. We can talk about that a bit later, I think, but rhetorical forms work to, to energize the brain to start processing and receiving information. Okay. And that's why the simple, straightforward, often passive voice prose of Wikipedia will get you the information but it will not get you motivated. It will not stick in your brain unless you're unless it's the information you're looking for. 
and you're motivated to get it no matter how you get it. That's one thing. But if you're just passively seeing that stuff, this is what modern educators understand now. They don't use those old methods anymore. They use new methods. You, spend, you, you give out half the information, you put it in a narrative format, the students walk away knowing something and they're changed. Put in twice as much information, get it out there as quote, efficiently as possible. The students might pass the test, but they're not changed. Okay, and that, that, that's why that's so important, you know, those things you're saying. Um, well, and, and, and so what I'm, what I'm getting out of this is that we, we think of our messaging. Well, first off, we think of messaging, and I, I don't know, so many people have different definitions. I don't get it. For me, it's really simple. A message is whatever comes out of your mouth when you open it up to speak. You know, and um, right. but but that message uh, is doing more, you know, so so we want to think that when we let a message out, even when we've carefully considered that what we're really letting out is a string of meaning, which we hope takes root in the person's brain. What you're saying here, what I'm getting out of a lot of what you said tonight is what what we're also getting at if we do it right, is you're kind of grease in the skids, you're, you're, you're kind of uh, um, uh, enervating a, a pathway, a story, for example, has a, you know, it has a, uh, uh, a procession of, of events, a sequence of events that, uh, and so your message is, you know, it's, it's carrying meaning, but it's also, if done right, works, it, it's almost like a key that fits in the way the brain handles information best. And, and if you can figure out that key, then your messages are going to go in better. So it's not just like we, we talk about framing as find the right word and do that. But uh, the rhetorical forms you're talking about uh, kind of, you know, kind of grease it, uh, grease things up so they get in and, and work right. Is, is so, yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to switch the order of what I was thinking about doing originally uh, and say something now that I was going to save for later. But talking about the rhetorical forms. I just wrote a blog post on this, uh, which you can go look at. But just re if you read Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, okay, carefully, he uses metaphors. He uses spatial metaphors of landscape. He uses some biblical references. He uses various different metaphors, and he has a message. And he uses these metaphors to frame the message a couple of times. And that is done with repetition, okay? He's repeating, um, he's repeating the, some of the same terms. He's using, you know, like I have a dream that, I have a dream that, I have a dream and so on. He's using these re repetitions and metaphors and in there, that's the, that's the modular, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the radio wave. And the message sitting on the radio wave is something about racism and equity and history of African Americans and so on. And then he does it again. It's a carrier. Then he does it again. But this time, he's upped the level of the metaphor. He's now using his metaphors in the metaphors. And then he does it again. And the last time he does it, every time he does it, by the way, he's speaking in iambic pentameter. Okay? He is. And, and, he, do, and he does this mostly. And he does this again and again at several levels. And I, have, I actually have a note here I'm going to take a quick look at. Um, yeah, so the last round is free at last, free at last. We are free at last. That's not, he's talking about the free at last part, and he's doing it a third time. He's taking the, he's actually compressed his metaphors into a simpler form and added another metaphor on top of it. Much, much higher level, free at last, not just have a dream. I have a dream, I have a dream. We as the people are free at last. It's a much bigger thing. And he says the same things again with the iambic pentometer working again, and then he finishes with the phrase, thank God almighty, we are free at last, two final phrases, and to people listening to this, that's the highest level metaphor, right, God? And it's also, again, in an iambic pentameter, by the way, okay? So it's like, this is the, it's almost too, like, I wouldn't assign this speech to a student studying rhetoric because it's too easy, <laughs> you know, it's like so heavy, but, but it's like this, it's like you have, you know, Congressman Phillips is running for re-election. So he walks down the parade route in your local town and he waves to people. He's wearing blue, he's smiling, etc. Next time he comes by, he comes by again, the same parade, he comes by again. This time he's riding a horse and he's waving and staring out candy. 
Next time it comes by, he's on a giant float being drawn by white stallions and he's sending out, you know, more candy. I, it, that's what King's Speech is. It's like the same thing. This simple message is going by, going by again, it's going by again bigger. And that is cranking up all those mechanisms in the brain using all those rhetorical forms. Very well done. And every great speech does that. In fact, King makes reference to the great speeches by starting off stealing the lines from Pericles' funerary oration, which you will know of as the Gettysburg Address, because Lincoln also stole those initial lines four score and seven years ago. Uh, different years, different dates, but it's a way of referencing time. Okay, so anyway, yes, it's so it's just big, giant metaphors made out of little or metaphors, made up little or metaphors, like Lekhoff says, everything's a metaphor. Um, when he says metaphors we live by, he doesn't mean we have some nice metaphors we can use in our life. He means we do not think unless we're thinking in metaphors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by grasping, and so we're communicating that way anyway, but by grasping these and controlling them and expanding them and using them, you get what Joe Rahm, who's a communication guy, calls clicky and sticky in the modern form. Clicky meaning someone's going to pay attention to what you're saying, and sticky means you're going to remember what you said later. That isn't itself enough because they might get mad at you and be remembering you as a, somebody who said something stupid, but it's, that's what those rhetorical forms do. Is there going to be time for questions? Uh, there is a question in the chat right now uh, having to do with processing. Yeah, let's, um, yeah, go ahead. Let's uh, what do, uh, go ahead to the question. Go ahead. Well, it's from Gary and it's, and it's to Greg. And uh, the question is basically, uh, is Greg familiar with the Virginia Tech political disgust study? Uh, where it seemed to find that conservatives process political thought through the disgust center. Yeah, I have. I, I remember that study is some time back. But yeah, um, there there actually were a series of studies done in around around 2010 through 2015 or so, um, and this was very much part of some of the early framing research too. Not early, middle age framing. Early framing is from the 70s, and um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't remember the study that well, but it, it's it's kind of a fun idea to imagine that they're thinking of things as poop and we're thinking of things as virtue. <laughs> I'll buy that. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look the study carefully though, because uh, you know MRI studies are you have to look at them very carefully. Can it's I just, just add? <clears throat> can I just add that uh, they they were they were showing people um, images while they were being. Um, observed in an fMRI machine and the single most persuasive image that that study seemed to say was uh, the um, the separated actually uh, liberals from conservatives was showing them a picture of a, um, a dead mutilated dog's body mm -hmm. and and the the dog the sorry the the conservatives tended to say yuck and the uh, liberals tended to, to I mean think as if they were saying um, uh, oh my what a poor dog poor dog so anyway, that, that's what I recall right. from it. And just to Google, anybody can Google Virginia Disgust, sorry, Virginia Tech Political Disgust Study. And, and there's news coverage of it that I'm sure is completely reductive. But anyway. Yeah, probably is. Yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's an empathy versus not mm -hmm. kind of thing. And fear, um, kind of, um, you know, I wonder how, you know, in this thing, fear is in a way, uh, it's a way to short circuit some of the things that we've been talking about. I mean, I know these things are built in and that people react in certain ways, but it seems that fear, fear turns off the rational thought. I mean, when, when, when you're afraid, your thought options are limited or, or constrained. And um, mm. so that seems similar here. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, uh, and I saw something else in the uh, chat. I have to say, Nick, Nick uh, Gorski brought up the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs> I, I really, that's George Bernard Shaw. I love that. That's your really, thanks, Nick. That's great. Um, uh, I, let me see if there were some other questions that we yeah, absolutely so had to get to. I don't. It. Can you comment on loss framing that it is memorable and meaningful and easier to grasp? That's a question for George. The, the, uh, the loss framing I'm, uh, familiar with is um, is the it, it, which I should have brought up earlier is a book called F Thinking Fast and Slow, which is kind of what Greg was talking about earlier when we we've been evolved to 
to uh, to think along certain ways as have all of our previous evolutionary ancestors and that our ability to reason is new. And, and the way I put it is that that ability, the slow way of thinking is not our default state. Our default state is the, the fast way of thinking that keeps us alive in the moment. Um, now, uh, but uh, in that book, they talk about how uh, this is from behavioral economics, which is really interesting because finally economists, some of them have realized that they aren't, uh, they aren't their own science, they're a branch of psychology. And that- uh, uh, And anthropology. And, and anthropology. And that, that people, people weigh loss more than they weigh gain. They're, they're way more afraid of it. So this, that which, which was a key insight in, uh, in totally blowing apart the notion of the rational actor in economics. That, you know, our, our economic theory in the West uh, our capitalist economic theory is completely based on the assumption that people will will you know look at what it is what decision they're going to make about spending their money, and that is going to be a logical uh, weighing of the of the pros and the cons, and that people will in the aggregate generally come to the right decision, whatever that is. That's that's my context for loss framing. Polly, was that what you were talking about though? Yeah, I was talking, I was thinking about, you know, um, just in terms of the, the metaphors around environmental work and the risk to clean water, for example, and that you just don't hear a lot of that, um, at least in what I'm reading in greater Minnesota newspapers. And just wondering, you know, if that's a missed opportunity that we maybe should be exploring. Do you mind if I throw this to the expert we actually have here tonight on exactly <laughs> that? Hobie, are you willing to uh, talk about that? And then Hobie also, later on, we, uh, he had sent a, uh, a nice uh, uh, framing Hall of Shame contestant that we'll talk to you right before we leave. But Hobie, do you want to address that loss? Uh, framing? Um. Just, just briefly in the sense that almost every environmental or climate campaign that I see has loss invoked in it. Uh, save the boundary waters, you know, implies don't lose the boundary waters. Um, I think it works to capture attention. I don't know whether it works to attract people um, I think a more significant way to do that is to talk about how your values are being violated by whatever that loss actually is. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, you know, it, it, it's certainly one that is connected with fear, uh, as George spoke earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful, Polly? Uh, well, I'll, I'll throw a link to uh, Hobie's blog in the uh, follow-up too. Hobie's very good at environmental framing and messaging as well as general framing and messaging, uh, which is great. Now, there are other questions in here. And uh, Greg, I think I we pretty- more questions in the chat. So if you guys have more to talk about, yeah, yeah, I, 10 more minutes. There, there, there is one more kind of concept we only barely touched on, I think it was worth mentioning, which is uh, another aspect of, of sort of thinking about linguistic process in the brain and all that is how we come to understand something to be true or how we come to accept something as um, normal. And uh, the first thing to say about it is that we habituate ourselves. It's like I was showing George, this to George earlier. This is a uh, COVID test. First time you take a, a COVID test like this at home, you carefully read the directions and you carefully follow each step so you don't mess it up. Next time you do it, like the part where you put the drops in, you just compress those specific instructions into a simple step. Next time you do it, you pretty much just do it without thinking about it. You internalize it. I think, George, you would use the example of playing music. Mm -hmm. You don't even remember you're playing the song while you're playing. Driving is like that too. We internalize things and make, and there's a guy named Charles Sanders Peirce, the philosopher who wrote the most about, he invented pragmatism. He wrote the most about language and thinking. And anyway, he wrote so much that even though it's been 150 years, we're still, haven't finished reading what he wrote. 
the people who read his stuff. <laughs> and he literally, he used to go to Harvard Square and beg for pencils and go back to his room and write. Okay. Anyway, um, but anyway, he has this idea. He explains how we internalize things. He calls it habit formation. But don't think about habits like habits. Just think about it as normalization of process. So when something is not habituated in your mind, it's uncomfortable or it causes a discomfort, he would say. And then as we incorporate it through a process he calls abduction, which is a process of inference that he kind of invented that he thinks is what we humans normally use, it becomes fixed in your mind and it becomes powerfully fixed in your mind. So I'll give you an example. You've all done something like this. I parked my car in the parking lot, went to work, came back, walked over to my car. I'm walking towards the blue Volvo. I notice there's a car seat in the back of the blue Volvo like they're supposed to be, like he's not working. I'm trying to get my key to work. I'm thinking, while I'm, while I'm working on my key, I'm thinking, who took the car seat out and replaced it with a different model of car seat? Wait, what's that junk on this seat over? That's not my junk. That's someone else's junk. I'm, I'm, I'm like writing off all these facts that are telling me this is not your car. <laughs> and I'm ignoring all the facts, even though they're right there and I'm discovering them. I go get that like the six back and I realize this is not my car. Okay. And you've all done that kind of thing. How can you have a belief in your head so firmly fixed that fact after fact after fact after fact does not deny that belief in your head? And the reason is because in a Persian sense, it's become fixed as a habit. In my case, and the early semioticians talked about Sherlock Holmes' use of this form of inference. Sherlock Holmes solved crimes by having a comprehensive memory of all of the crimes he could find out about everywhere. Then he'd discover a crime, someone would come to him with a crime, and he would try to match it with an existing crime. And when he got it matched with a close crime, the closest crime he knew about, he then knew about the rest of the crime by inference through this kind of inference. It's not deduction, it's not inference. It's a different kind of inference that first called abduction. And then he'd take the parts that he wasn't sure about, and then he'd form hypotheses about those and test them. Okay. So what, what, we, what this tells us is that people have in their minds are very, very firmly held beliefs. And the way to get beliefs to change or evolve or, or just simply add new beliefs is to have them become habituated. So this is what I, I, what I think we should be doing. I read a letter writing group called Indivisible Inc. Writing, writing letters to the editor. And I think, and I can't get my colleagues to agree to this. They won't do this because it doesn't seem right to them, but I think it's right, okay? Write a letter that says, government is good. I had an experience. My, my, my representative in the Senate, I needed a favor. I, I, there's a problem I had, and they fixed it for me. Isn't that nice? Write a letter that says something like that. Just not, I'm responding to this thing Trump did, and I'm angry. No, that's good too. Do that stuff too, whatever. Make it good framing, make it good messaging, but also, just have, it, have us the ideas we want that we can say in a newspaper. Democracy works because we have access to voting. Yep. Demo government is helpful and good. Uh, empathy is what we want to see in our leaders. You know, Whatever those messages are, don't react to the current news story. Just say those things as facts to your friends, to your neighbors, to your children, to Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving, and to the editor through a letter to the editor. So those things just become normalized. What Peirce is talking about, what happens in our brain, these fixed, deeply held beliefs, those are things that are normalized in our brains. And those are the things against which new information is tested. And if it doesn't fit that information, that is thrown out. Our brains should already have been normalized to understand the germ theory, folks. It wasn't. We have failed our own species by not having that normalized in our brains culturally. If it was, there'd be no anti-vaxxers. Well, or for a long time, vaccines were accepted. People didn't question it. For the most part, very, very few vaccine deniers were fringes. But when, if you uh, spend enough time, enough uh, and use the tricks of propaganda and such, right. and uh, especially tying it up with identity, which the Republicans have done, then it is possible to get people to think differently, which is, a, is terrible in this case, but gives me some hope, is maybe this is a good way to, to segue out of this, it gives me some hope that uh, if we do things right, and, and the, more, the more we know about this, the more we expose ourselves to it, and you've heard, heard us repeat things tonight, you've heard before, 
because the more we internalize this, the better we are at our, or the better our brains become at getting to the right message earlier. And so I, I think there's hope for not only for us, but if if we do this in our messaging, uh, I, I think we're going to be in better shape. I we're we're hitting uh, we're, we're two minutes from eight, and uh, uh, a lot of times we stick around and talk for a little bit. Just want to let people know we've we've covered uh, most of what we've what we set out to accomplish tonight. Uh, Lisa uh, can tell us we've got some events coming up. We do have some things scheduled coming up here real quick. Oh, before that, Hobie, do you want me to? Talk, or, or do you want to mention your 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 framing uh, disaster of the week, <laughs> which I I encourage the rest of you to also look for framing to the uh, candidates for the framing hall of shame, and candidates for the framing hall of fame. And he doesn't mean like good and he doesn't mean political candidates for office. He means uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, it's always easier to uh, look for the, uh, <clears throat> the the frames of shame rather than, <laughs> than the other way around. I do some work oh, with fine. different different environmental organizations, and a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the head of communications of the Sierra Club for Illinois, and uh, sh she told me she wanted to start a campaign. Uh, and I will give you the campaign title, and then I'll ask for feedback about what, how do you feel about it? Does it connect? And uh, it has to do with natural gas. And her campaign was simply, natural gas is not clean. So that's it. And I want you to think about that. Anybody chime in for 30 seconds or a minute and let me know what you think about that. What's wrong with that? Just pop right in. Well, how many people like it? Maybe we should show no, there, it. There, there's no, there's no zing. Okay. It. It's flat. No, it goes, goes down. down. No zing. No zing. It, doesn't, it doesn't rise to the occasion. Okay, Ron. Well, it, it's you're not supposed well, to do the on, negative. Ryan. Okay, we got. Uh, a negative, it's a negative, okay. And Ron, if you take yourself off mute. Still can't hear you, Ron. Okay, we're gonna move on. Oh, there oh. you it's, it's a negative, it doesn't tell me what to do, it tells me what not to do. Yes, okay. So you're sort of, we're sort of getting in on it. Um, the way the brain works, and we've heard some theory about metaphors and that sort of thing today is, that it doesn't always hear um, the not in between. And uh, both Lakoff and uh, not Shankar Osario will use this term, don't feed what you fight. So that by acknowledging a frame that of your opposition, even trying to negate it, you elevate it at the same time. And the brain, what the brain hears in this is natural gas and clean. It doesn't hear natural gas is not clean. And we got ourselves into that in part in the climate movement by saying clean coal is not clean. And so, you know, moving off that, we're better off using a direct statement and pivoting to our position, which might be something like, uh, methane gas is dirty, or methane gas is toxic. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. I was at a workshop where they talked about there is no such thing as clean coal, and then followed that up with a positive statement about what it actually was. <laughs> is that you're, you're still you're still in your opposition's narrative in that case, we'd be better off just speaking about subject, verb, object for what we want. Uh, somebody's, Greg's got in there, dirty gas is unnatural. Coal is always dirty. Coal is toxic is, is a good example of 
better statements to use. Mm -hmm. um, we recognize also that the term natural gas is a frame as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the person that I was talking to said, well, we want to we want to get out there before it gets established that natural gas is clean. And I, my point would be, wait a minute, the, 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 the environment, the frame around this has already been out there that natural ga it, gas is natural. So there's a study I put a link in the, the, the blog or, or the chat earlier on a blog about what do we what words do we use how do republicans respond to certain words how do democrats respond to certain words interestingly methane and methane gas referring to this uh, is is seen as a negative by both republicans and democrats while fracked gas is seen as a positive by republicans as an example so that was tested and my final thing would be just to say for whatever we do for whatever campaigns we launch we should test what we're doing as opposed to just throwing it up against the wall and trying to let it stick because otherwise we may be actually helping the opposition in the process if we don't do that anyway and also for helping uh voters to think about things they never thought about before. Uh, saw a commercial here in Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Health. There's two guys on a boat, they're fishing. One guy goes and they're having a discussion about vaccines. And so the the person who's gonna, you know, tell the truth about vaccines says, so, you know, you're asking me about this. Well, you know, you've heard that some people say that uh, vaccines cause, you know, whatever, some kind of terrible thing. And then he says, well, that's not true. And here's why. And then he goes, and you may have heard that that vaccines do this and this and this and that's not true and he names about six or seven of these things and by the end of the thing i'm thinking they're going i wonder how many people never thought that any of those things were of concern to anyone now they're going it's in a commercial somebody's thinking about it, it must be true or you get these things in the mail from various you know uh fundraising deals uh from usually issue oriented organizations and what it does is it lists the statements that the opposition says in big bold letters in one sentence then there's an entire paragraph below that in regular type that goes into detail about why it's wrong so as with we what we all do with with mail you know you have a, roughly about you know two or three seconds to determine whether it's going in the trash or not uh, through the recycling uh, what people are going to see when they look at that are all the bolded messages you just gave them all of the messages your opponent uh, you know, is using and, and you repeat them again, you're educating your opponent as to what their messages are. Uh, so, you know, and, and it comes down like good Greg was talking, this is so much of a, of a, a biological, neurological, anthropological, psychological, uh, you know, body that we have that processes things. We um, just the simple pairing of the words, the word not doesn't matter. The simple pairing of the words gas and clean lights up the gas frame in people's heads lights up the clean frame and what happens with the nerve cells in between them a connection has been made and every time that's repeated and they they see that you can see this in action i actually i'll i gotta find it for people it's a, there was a video that showed brain connections literally physically being made between neurons and uh, and what happens is every time that same connection is made, every time you say clean coal, the connection between those, those clusters of neurons gets stronger. If there's something that can, uh, can inhibit that or, can, or, or negates it, if that's hurt enough, you weaken that connection and strengthen the other one. That's why the repetition is so really important. In fact, uh, a, real, a quote that I heard recently I really like is, Fewer messages repeated more often. I would change that to fewer messages repeated ad nauseum. Figure out what we need to say and say it all the time. And uh, I, I think because this election is going to force us, I think, to focus an awful lot on voting because that right now is under so much threat with uh, easily a third of the states now having already passed legislation saying that they're legislature or some other state body 
can go in and just say, no, we don't care who you voted for for president. We think there's something wrong. So we're just going to seat an alternate slate of electors. Or we don't like, we, we think there have been shenanigans at the county level. We're going to negate what they did. And we're just going to make that decision for you. So in effect, in, in a third of the states now, we don't have democracy anymore. We don't, not as we've known it. And so I think as we focus more and more on this, on, on, and this will be the subject of one of the upcoming seminars, uh, that we, we need to really focus on this and on the dangers that we face right now with uh, the potential loss of democracy or the ongoing chipping away at it. Uh, anyway, I should shut hey, up. Hey, George, one, yeah. one quick follow up here. Tom put a uh, note in the chat that says, is there a place to find tested framing or words to use? Yeah, that's, um, yeah go ahead, Colby. Yeah, the, the, the best source that I, I see now is the, um, Chica Geronimo, uh, Anat Shankar Osario, and maybe you can put that, Lisa or George, into the. I was, I was um, looking that up, and yeah. um, they don't have a website. So I'm trying to figure out how I can get this information to people. What they do is they have, uh, they have uh, webinars. Uh, they call them um, every two weeks. Yeah. Every two weeks, yeah. and they uh, on messaging, and they do research their messages and uh, they have money and okay. so they're great but i i'm i will i'm going to see if i can figure out if there's a place that one can go to just find these things or uh figure out some kind of way for people to uh, be able to actually sign up for their messaging um uh what do they call them they have a name for them uh but yeah. they uh, uh movement messaging and uh and then they always send follow-ups with lots of, but it's always around a very specific topic area that's, uh, that's uh, going on right now. But I will do a little research on that and see if I can figure out how to get that information out to people in a way, because they, they are a group that does test messages. Their, 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 their main structure is they will talk about what an issue is. They'll present the findings of their focus groups or uh, their dial polling that, you know, where people turn the dial on the craft changes. And uh, then they will kind of come down on uh, a, a fairly, um, it, 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 uh, they'll come down basically on, on one message uh, or uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much one message and that message fits into a structure that they have. And sometimes they will also include an embrace and replace uh, matrix. So they'll say, uh, replace clean coal with dirty coal or whatever. And then, and then they tell you why. And, and this is really good. I personally, I think the best thing about these is you get to see a notch Schenker Osario, or Osario um, uh, speak. She's absolutely amazing. Her brain is like so lightning fast. She, she can frame, she can frame, you know, uh, circles around Frank Luntz, the evil conservative framing genius. And so well, and it's, it's, it's worth cool. noting also uh, that like those matrices of what words to use instead, that's not a one-time deal. This is an ongoing process that the words that we're saying don't use now might've been words we were saying, sometimes they're just bad framing, but sometimes they're words that we actually were using effectively before, but these things change over time. And it's really important that that research be ongoing and continuous to keep up to date. Right. What, what, uh, what, what doesn't happen in, in these are more what we do here, which I think is important. You, it, it's one thing to know what to say or have someone tell you what to say. It's a whole lot better if you can say it for yourself. I believe that those exact words are in the Bible in some form or another, right? Uh, it's, it's better to teach people to frame than to give them the frame. And As so, with fish, teaching the fish. Yes, it was right. about fish. <laughs> I, I also have a suggestion, George, and um, I, you might have you might have missed it today. I'm sorry if I jumped in, Tom. Um, oh. that that is that is if we're doing local messaging, or let's say it's on polymet the polymet mine, or hog farming in southern Minnesota, there's unlikely to be existing framing. It, it would be useful to have a small group to be able to respond to say, okay, here's what we think based on our knowledge there. Here might be some things you can consider. 
and or if the issue is important enough, actually figure out how to go test it. What a, a great segue into just mentioning that we're going to do our three hour workshop. And in that, we do a process that we call stop, drop and roll. It's an easy way to remember it. And this is a process you can use to pick apart any issue that's out there and come up with some effective messaging on it. And uh, the three hour workshops coming up what, in a couple of weeks. February 5th, Saturday, February oh, 5th. Very, very soon. And uh, and, and that's good. But we also make that same uh, a process. We have that in a handout. And so we can get that. And then we have also done stop, drop and roll sessions with people. So mm -hmm. we're doing, we've been doing one. Um, we did one not that long ago on the uh, school board attacks. And, uh, and, and, and the method based, you know, very quickly is the stop part is to stop and figure out what's really going on. And the stop is really important because what we normally do is we just respond the, the, the way we've always responded. We don't think about it. So stop and think for a moment, figure out what's going on. What is everyone saying? You, your opponents, people in the news, people that you meet on the street, the, all of the, 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 uh, the stakeholders that you hear at school boards, school board members, such, and figure out what everybody's saying. See if you can discern what frames they are using. Republicans like the cost frame on a lot of things. See if you can discern the frames. Second part is to drop. Drop the stuff that doesn't work. Get out of the, the mode of going to facts and logic all the time. There's a number of other things to drop that we do that are important. And for sure, drop the things that you found in the stop phase that, uh, your, uh, that your opponent is saying. And then roll with a well-framed message using your values. And so this is just a way to think about approaching this. And yeah, we've we've done that for for groups before. If they, uh, you know, if they needed it, we we do some consulting on this. And, so, uh, George. Yes, Tom. I'm sorry, you've had your hand up for like since yesterday. Uh, no, I'm not really, but that's okay. Um, I I have been on um, Jiggy's. Uh, couple of phone or messages, but I did post the latest one about the uh, freedom to vote. It's on, it's one of that I sent there. And that's a toolkit that they send out that's actually a, a Google doc. And there is a ton of stuff in there. It's unbelievable. There are, there's gifts that you can use. There's all kinds of information. And then, you know, so that's, if you can get on her mailing list, then every two weeks, you can get an invite to their they're, it's usually around noon when they do about an hour. And the last one I was on, Chuck Schumer was on there. Yep. So they got Chuck Schumer to, you know, talk for about 15 minutes. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to, um, uh, I would highly recommend today, especially saving the chat. So if you open up the chat window in Zoom, go down to the very bottom, right next to the smiley face and click the three dots and click save chat and you'll get the, a lot of the links that Tom put in and Sandra and Greg put in links to uh, ASO communication. Uh, that's not Shankar uh, Osario. And there are other ones. So um, uh, Hobie's, Hobie's website and some others. So uh, do that. Um, we're, we also have coming up, you, uh, do you wanna talk about the other ones coming up? Well, why don't you talk about the next one? It's okay. on uh, February 7th, Monday, February 7th. That's our next uh, webinar. You can okay, talk so, about the, so the three-hour workshop is February 5th. Uh, February 7th, we're going to be talking about, uh, this is something that I've been wrestling with for a while. Uh, how do we talk about Republicans? And Democrats are, are reticent to do a number of things. We don't like to use ad hominem attacks. We don't want to attack people directly. We are... Uh, we are afraid of sounding like we're criticizing the other side when we're talking to voters because we don't want voters to think that we are negative. And there are a number of other things that we're afraid to do or reticent to do. Uh, but at this point in time, we're doing voters a disservice if we don't talk about it. So we've got a problem here. And how do we deal with that? And uh, I, uh, I'm going to go over that. I'm going to talk about that and my explorations in that. And uh, I'm also going to be looking for a lot of feedback from people here. Those of you who have been coming to these for a while know we get some great people in, in these, uh, these webinars. And uh, we like to have a community 
here rather than just pre uh, tonight was mostly presentation. But, uh, you know, I want to hear from you, too, because I'm still working through this. But we will do people a disservice if we do not talk about the some of the real dangers that uh, are coming about in, in November. Uh, that that could very well happen that changes American democracy, uh, you know, basically locks in the the incremental change the Republicans have done. So we'll be talking about that. And then um, on uh, Monday, February 28th, uh, our, we're going to have our uh, guest, uh, Ken Martin, who is one. the chair of the um, Minnesota DFL party. He is also a vice chair of a Georgia, the two other things. In, uh, you, of the Associ Association for State Democratic Committees. It's basically the leadership in each state, the, each, the, the state chairs and uh, vice chairs, execs. And uh, they're, uh, so he, he's the, the chair of all of those chairs, which is kind of cool. And the vice chair of the Democratic, uh, was he, it the DNC? He is a DNC vice chair also. Yeah. Uh, and those of you, us who are here about that time last year, uh, Ken came on and it was great. I think people mm -hmm. were, it was, yeah, some of you remember that too and others. Yeah. That was pretty amazing. So Ken's going to come on again and we're going to talk about it. This is your chance to get, uh, get to talk to a DNC vice chair and somebody who believes in framing and who gets it and uh, ask questions and Ken's not afraid of tough questions, so uh, you know, go for it. Don't, I mean, don't don't rip him to shreds, but ask him questions. He's a he's a great guy, a lot of fun, and uh, he has. A, the, there are people from Washington, a number of them who come to this, and a few other states. Ken got us connected with the state chairs around the country, and uh, that's where we've been able to make connections in other states. So uh, that's been great. And, uh, and I think that's it. Uh, I just right want now. to say um, to thank Greg for coming on tonight. And yeah. Greg, you said one thing, and it, and this is so true in my experience of tonight. Uh, I I've tried to read George Lakoff's books, and sometimes they're you know it's kind of hard, and I'm not retaining the information like I should. And then the way you describe things tonight, it went like boom, and that was like oh now I get it, now I understand. It was fascinating, and I do appreciate that you were here tonight yeah. to explain this in a way that um, was interesting to my brain, and it could accept the information. Yeah, way well, I could help a little. Indeed, and uh, as always, we like to hear from people. Don't be afraid to email or uh, or uh, whatever you know. Contact us if you need us. We'll go from there. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, we'll we'll wrap it up and really looking forward to seeing you next time. And uh, uh, maybe we'll go all go to YouTube and look up those programs we watched as children. <laughs> <laughs> That's for fun. Woo, thanks, all right, everybody. everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. ConnectionsLab.org.